replaced by some Democrat, it won't be a Democrat who says, you know, we were just too hard on China. <laughs> we were just too mean. I mean, there'll be different issues. It might be all of a sudden Xinjiang. We sort of, you know, wh where has Trump talked about Xinjiang? Uh, zero. Um, all of a sudden, human rights might <coughs> pop back as a major, major issue between the two countries. Um, and again, this is assuming a Democrat wins, well, there'll be a lot of, presumably, there'll still be a lot of tariffs in place. That Democrat, whoever that person is, isn't going to just remove them without some concessions or some movement on the part of the Chinese. Now, assume Trump wins. Well, who knows, Scott? I mean, you know, I mean, the election presumably would, I mean, my, my guess is he will be um, saying, you know, claiming uh, that China's been a great victory, you know, and, and that'll help him keep the markets uh, steady, if not going up. But, you know, but if he has a second term and the deal, as all of us, I think, have said, is, you know, likely to be, um, you know, uh, not live up to the, um, the goals that they initially put out. Well, I mean, you could, you could see the, you know, the, the dispute getting harsher and harsher, the reinforcement of war tariffs. <coughs> that quickly. I mean, I think that, you know, obviously you will see this um, trajectory of underlying tensions continue. I mean, think, you, things have just changed with the attitude of the business community with the focus politically here from both the right and the left on China's unfair trade practices. So that obviously is not going to change. Um, you may see the tools change somewhat. Um, you know, the focus on bilateral versus multilateral action, um, the use of tariffs, although, you know, Democrats Tend to be can tend to be quite friendly to tariffs as well. I know that they've seen President Trump um, take this path. You, maybe we will see more tariffs. I mean, I, I think an interesting question now is whether um, the president has fundamentally changed for future administrations the kinds of tactics that they take toward trade as well by dusting off some of these um, older trade tools like Section 232 and using them in novel ways. Does that mean if Democrats will continue to use them? in the future as well. Um, and you know, as much as um, people might argue with the tariffs and the potential, you know, the, the harm that, they're, uh, that they are causing on the US economy, even as the president negotiates, I think you know, there's a general consensus that these tariffs are working to at least bring partners to the negotiating table to exert some kind of leverage on foreign um, companies. So future administrations of either party might be reluctant to, to give that up now that that is a, a standard. Okay, one last question. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Jean with Baker Hosteller. I have a follow-up question that is, is there a key group of influencer on China policy right now in town? either on the Hill, in the White House, or within the think tank or business community. And when we talk about trade, I'm also referring to CFIRS and export control. Thank you. I mean, um, so, uh, you know, there, there, there are all the kind of traditional constituencies which have an influence on trade. Um, but it's unclear um, how much uh, the White House and the administration is listening to them. Um, so we know that, um, say, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other business groups have been sort of partially um, involved in discussions about the, the China trade deal and have had conversations with, uh, with the administration uh, about, uh, about the deal, but I don't think it's to the same extent that it traditionally has been in other administrations. Um, so the business community is is involved, but um, is not. It's it's not clear uh, to what extent um, they they really um, sort of have the pulse of uh, of what's going on. Um, uh, and then um, you have a kind of you have this coterie of sort of China hawks, um, influential China hawks who were sort of on the margins of the of the debate. Um, for many years, and who now are being 
you know, closely listened to, um, uh, at least by um, people in the White House and, and even Trump himself. Um, people often mention, uh, you know, Mike Pillsbury and uh, um, uh, the Hudson Institute and others um, uh, as kind of within that category. Um, and, um, uh, and then you have, uh, on the other end, I think we did, we did a story last, last year um, about the sort of the intermediaries from Wall Street who are trying to um, uh, kind of try to find some kind of an accommodation between the sides. Um, uh, and so people like Steve Schwartzman and Hank Paulson, who I think sort of, especially in the depths of the, uh, of the tensions of, uh, in the fall of, uh, of 2018, um, tried to set things back on the path which um, they're on at the moment. Um, and they also had their um, sort of constituents in the White House who would listen to them, um, people like Kudlow and, and Mnuchin and others, and even you know, uh, the president himself. So I think the, the, there is a kind of broadcast of characters, um, but it's very hard to tell who's, um, who Trump is going to listen to in the end. I mean, from my point of view, it's a remarkably narrow group of people that influences this administration and makes decisions, including a remarkably narrow group of uh, China experts. Um, you mentioned Mike Pillsbury, who uh, wrote the book 100 Year Marathon, which makes the argument that um, uh, that the hardliners in China, that we, we always hear, people like us, always hear from the reformers because their people want to talk to Western reporters. And then there are all the other people, you know, who we never hear from because they, they uh, don't want a combination with the West. And anyway, so Mike's argument is that those people really have the power and we haven't paid them enough attention. So he came to prominence as a China hawk. In this group, he's a moderate. He wants a deal. And that makes him a moderate. So it's... <laughs> It's an unusual cast of characters, to say the least. Uh, great discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks to the audience for attending this morning and to our terrific panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, our panelists. Delighted to have so many of you here today. Uh, look forward to hosting you again. Thank you. I hope you continue covering WENA in the uh, in the months to come as we continue to try to. Uh, shed some light on what's happening in the trade debate. Please join us again on May 9th when we discuss uh, the WTO e-commerce initiative in digital trade. Thanks again to everybody.